Welcome to another edition of Coonrod's Corner, brought to you by the Rogers Corporation. Today's topic, comparisons of microstrip and grounded coplanar waveguides at millimeter wave frequencies. Now here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, welcome to Coonrod's Corner. My name is John Coonrod and I am a technical marketing manager for Rogers Corporation. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, comparisons of microstrip and grounded coplanar waveguide at millimeter wave frequencies. Now this will be the second Coonrod's Corner on this topic. The previous one was done about two years ago, a similar title, and that was pretty much um, what are the pros and cons of uh, comparisons between microstrip and coplanar circuits. Now this uh, episode today is really going to be looking at um, more comparisons between the microstrip and grounded coplanar waveguide in regards to millimeter wave or higher frequencies. And also I'm going to be looking at different aspects that can impact these higher frequency applications. There's really four topics that I want to talk about today. The first one is the position of the grounding vias that's used in the grounded coplanar waveguide. Another topic will be the trapezoidal effects, and I'll explain this in more detail as we go. And then after that will be copper plating thickness, and then finally I'll talk about how the final plating thickness variation can impact performances on a microstrip and a grounded coplanar waveguide circuit. The picture shown here is uh, really showing two different cross-sectional views of a grounded coplanar waveguide. The one on the left has a lip that's smaller than the one on the right. The lip that I'm referring to is the distance between the grounding via edge to the ground plane edge on the coplanar layer of the circuit. And what happens is when the lip is very small compared to a larger lip, the larger lip is going to cause more parasitic plate inductances, it's going to cause higher impedance to happen as well as having more conductor losses compared to the circuit with the smaller lip. Now this issue really comes in to be an issue when you're comparing models to real world uh, measurements. And uh, I see this a lot really because doing a model on this type of structure is difficult to really account for the lip accurately. Uh, most models for grounded coplanar waveguide will assume the edge of the uh, via will be adjacent to the edge of the grounding plane on the coplanar layer. And that's easy to do for a model, but unfortunately, that's not a good model when you're looking at very high frequencies. Now, if you do this type of model at lower frequencies, like microwave range of frequencies, you probably won't see a lot of difference between the measured results of the circuit and the model. However, at millimeter wave frequencies, again, with a much smaller wavelength, higher frequency, it's much more sensitive to any kind of anomaly like this, and you will see a difference. So you should talk to your printed circuit board fabricator and find out how to minimize that lip and also what the tolerance is for how much that lip can vary from one circuit to another in normal manufacturing. Next, let's talk about the trapezoidal effects. The trapezoidal effects are really uh, an effect due to how the circuit is made. And if you look at an ideal grounded coplanar waveguide on most uh, simulation software, it will show you conductors that are rectangular in shape in a cross-sectional view. However, if you look at a lot of microsections of real circuits, you'll find that normally that's not the case. Normally in a cross-sectional view, the conductor is more trapezoidal shape. And that trapezoidal shape does vary from one circuit to another. And that can cause differences in a grounded coplanar waveguide. Now for microstrip, the trapezoidal shape and the variation of that shape causes very little differences. You can find some differences but not much. But usually with grounded coplanar waveguide, the differences of that trapezoidal shape compared to a rectangular shape is very significant. And any kind of models and simulations should try to account for that difference. The picture as shown here is showing two cross-sectional views of a grounded coplanar waveguide. The one on the left has rectangular shaped conductors. The picture on the right has conductors that are trapezoidal shaped and is actually more indicative of what you find in a real world example when you do microsections on a circuit. Now the differences of this trapezoidal shape compared to rectangular, when you have a circuit that is trape trapezoidal shaped, uh, what happens is you have less fields fringing in the air, and that means uh, that the dielectric constant or the effective dielectric constant is going to be actually higher. So when you have more fields fringing in the air, in the case of the re rectangular shaped circuit, you are going to have a lower effective dielectric constant because the fields are using more air. And the same with losses. Uh, air is the lowest loss medium there is. So in the case of rectangular shape, the left circuit, you're going to have more fields coupled together in air, and the air is a low loss medium, obviously. In the case of trapezoidal shape on the right, the, basically the fields are less in the air, and also along with that, the RF current density actually will shift down to be closer to the base of the conductor 
are essentially at the copper substrate interface. And when the uh, RF current shifts lower down to that interface, what happens is the copper surface roughness of the copper itself will start coming into play even more. And when that happens, the roughness will impact the losses and even the phase response. So you can see some differences of uh, these circuits for rectangular shaped and trapezoidal shaped. And this is a real world uh, type of difference. Now to how to deal with that in models is rather difficult because you would have to predict how much trapezoidal shape you should put into your model. And that again would be a good conversation to have with your circuit fabricator to find out what they would recommend for the average trapezoidal shape for the particular circuit that you are having built. Now another evaluation that we looked at comparing microstrip and granite coplanar was the normal variation that we, that we will get when we have circuits built for copper plating thickness. If it's a plated through hole circuit, they have to plate the copper through the holes, obviously, and along with that, they usually plate up the circuit image as well. And there is normal copper uh, plating thickness variation from the circuit to circuit on the same panel as compared to panel to panel, and that is to be expected. In the case of microstrip, the evaluations we found when the copper is plated thin or thick, there's very little difference in uh, RF performance. You might see a slight difference in insertion loss, maybe a slight difference in effective decay, but not that big a deal. In the case of granite coplanar waveguide, we've seen uh, very big differences actually. And then in an effort to really understand these differences better, we did a pretty thorough study a few years ago where we used the same sheet of material that was 24 by 18, and we cut it in half. Half the sheets went off to have circuits made with thin copper, the other half a sheet went off circuits to make with th thicker copper. We did this purposely to minimize the effects of the material itself. And then what we looked at was phase response differences and also insertion loss differences. Again, looking at microstrip, loosely coupled granite coplanar waveguide and tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide. Now the following graph I'd like to show is really summarizing the, uh, the study just looking at the tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide. The graph shown here is showing the unwrapped phase angle measurements of two circuits. One circuit that was uh, made with thicker copper plating and the other with thinner copper plating. The red curve is using the thicker copper plating and the blue curve is the thinner copper plating. And you can see at 77 gigahertz, there's a pretty substantial difference in phase angle, about 65 degrees difference. And that translates to about a 0.1 difference in effective decay. Now keeping in mind, this is using the exact same sheet of material. The only difference is copper plating thick and thin. And uh, you can see a pretty remarkable difference here. So this is something to consider. Now if you do the same type of evaluation, thick and thin copper plating with microstrip, you will see a very slight difference. But instead of 65 degree phase angle difference, it's more like one or two degrees. It's very minimal and it's almost in the, the realm of measurement noise. So copper plating thickness in that variation can be something important to understand as you're designing a granite coplanar waveguide circuit. Lastly, let's discuss the effects of final plated finishes. And on microstrip compared to granite coplanar waveguide, we know that the differences are very real. And a microstrip circuit will have increased insertion loss when a lossy finish is plated to the copper, such as ENIG, electrous nickel immersion gold. Now, when you do the same thing with a granite coplanar waveguide, especially if it's tightly coupled, you will see very large increases in insertion loss compared to a bare copper circuit with a tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide. If it's loosely coupled, it acts more like a microstrip and you won't see as big a difference. The picture shown here is actually showing two different charts, uh, and these charts are actually using the exact same material. The material that was used to build these circuits was 5 mil thick RL3003 with rolled copper. So thin circuits with very low dielectric losses, and also I used rolled copper for these circuits, which means the copper itself is extremely smooth, and from circuit to circuit, there should be minimal variation due to the surface roughness of the copper. So this is really a pretty good comparison between final plated finishes, bare copper, and also different structures. The structure on the left is a microstrip transmission line. The structure on the graph on the right is a tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide. Now for each one of these charts, we're showing three different curves. The first curve for the microstrip on the left is a blue curve, and that is the insertion loss of a circuit that is just bare copper only, no plated finish. The orange curve and the gray curve are differences of ENIG with thick nickel and thin nickel. The thick nickel is the gray curve, the thin nickel plating for ENIG is the orange curve. And here you can see a pretty good difference for microstrip. Now the same type of idea on the chart on the right is granite coplanar waveguide using the same materials, except the circuit design is different. This is tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide. 
And you can see there is a difference in the y-axis scale. So to begin with, the granite coplanar waveguide does have more losses than the microstrip due to the final plated finishes. Also, you can see that the difference between the thin nickel and the thick nickel for the granite coplanar waveguide is about double the difference as compared to the microstrip chart on the left. So the difference in the plated finish thickness is much more impactful on a granite coplanar waveguide than it is on a microstrip circuit, and especially, as you can see, at millimeter wave, wave frequencies. This concludes this episode of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you're not already a member, join the Rogers Technical Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more Rogers Corporation informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Raj mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.